Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome, and everyone, thank you for joining us at Aquinas College and online. I am Jennifer Hess, chairperson and uh, professor in the biology department, and uh, I'm, I teach here at Aquinas College. So the Your Health Lecture Series is a unique educational partnership between Aquinas College and Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. The goal of the series is to feature physicians and researchers who can speak on a variety of topics of interest to public audiences. The speaker um, met with pre-med students prior to this public lecture. And um, additionally, Aquinas College pre-med students had the opportunity to take part in a roundtable discussion with MSU College of Human Medicine students. MSU College of Human Medicine and Aquinas College have been collaborating on this lecture series since 2013 as an extension of the Early Assurance Program agreement between our two schools. At the conclusion of Dr. Bupp's presentation, he will answer questions from the audience and those written into the Q&A feature of Zoom for as long as time allows. With that, I would like to introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Caleb Bupp is an assistant professor in the College of Human Medicine's Department of Pediatrics and Human Development and a medical genetics physician with Helen DeVos's Children's Hospital and Corwell Health of West Michigan, where he serves as division chief of medical genetics and genomics. His clinical interests include rare genetic syndromes, advancing diagnostic technology, and education, which has translated to research opportunities. Dr. Bupp has been involved in initiating, initiating rapid whole genome sequencing, <laughs> increasing the diagnostic yield of genetic and genomic testing, and helping facilitate increased access to testing throughout Michigan through Project Baby Deer. In addition, he has collaborated with many different teams to produce publications identifying rare genetic disorders and further understanding their phenotypes, including one publication where he collaborated with me. Hey. Um, notably, uh, he was part of a group that identified a novel genetic syndrome caused by ornithine decarboxylase 1 gene variants, now termed Bachmann-Bupp syndrome, and is involved in treating patients with this disorder with difluoromethyl ornithine. This work led to the formation of the International Center for Polyamine Disorders, where he serves as the clinical director. Dr. Bupp earned his medical degree from the University of Toledo College of Medicine. He completed a pediatric residency at the University of Louisville and his medical genetics residency at Greenwood Clinic uh, Genetic Center in Greenwood, South Carolina. So please help me welcome Dr. Buck. Microphones are always a little challenging with this beard to not get it stuck. Thanks everybody, appreciate the chance to get to hang out together. We are gonna have a fun hour running through all sorts of stuff. Um, and so uh, buckle up. Um, we're going to talk about some stuff. It's going to be helpful. I think uh, this will give you, if nothing else, uh, something that you'll want to talk around the dinner table to folks about. And I'm also always supposed to disclose stuff um, about things that happen. So when we think about the idea of precision medicine, what do, what do we mean when we talk about that? Is it like a research study? Is it like a machine that does tests? Is it like a vision or a building? And I think uh, in this current time, it's a little bit of everything. And it's really a fun time to work in genetics because we are finding lots of new things and understanding things. But I like to think in pictures a lot of times, a lot of what we do is kind of looking for a needle in a haystack. And the challenge there is we don't even know if there is a needle there, what it looks like, where to look. But I would submit to you that we are now in a place where we're looking for a needle in a haystack with a metal detector. So we are able to get more of a yes, no answer very quickly. And that helps us take care of our patients better, which is neat. As I go through this stuff, I wanna encourage you to like think about it with different hats on, okay? So think about this from the patient's perspective. Think about this from a family's perspective. If you have a child or a relative that has some of these things, think about it as a medical professional a nurse, a physician, a, a, a therapist. Think about it if you ran a hospital or an insurance company or you work for a university. 
There's lots of different ways to think about genetics in healthcare, um, and there are lots of neat aspects to it depending on what your perspective is. So we're going to start with some basics um, and then build upon that to uh, more fun stuff. Um, genetics has changed a lot, and these are a few of the reasons why. So in the upper left-hand corner, that is a, a, a plot of the cost of genetic testing, and the cost of genetic testing has plummeted. When we did the first genome, like the Human Genome Project, like 25 years ago, one genome took about 10 years, and it cost $2.7 billion. Now we can sequence someone's genome in under an hour for, depends on who you talk to and how you want to price it out, but somewhere between 100 bucks and 1000 bucks. That's insane to think about that much of a change in 25 years. But from like an economic standpoint, hopefully it makes sense that that has driven increased access to genetic testing because just straight up it's cheaper than it used to be, okay? Part of why it's cheaper is technology. So computers, sequencers, and things like that have made all of this easier to do. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner is a screenshot from something called Gene Matcher. It's kind of like Facebook Marketplace for genes where you can kind of connect with folks, folks that you really wouldn't have ever before. So our, our group worked with some folks in Saudi Arabia and Belgium to kind of help understand a specific gene. That just would not have been possible previously, but the world's gotten a lot smaller. And then in the upper right-hand corner, we're going to loop back to this at the end, um, 23andMe. We're just a little bit more comfortable with genetics as a, like as a society, if I can put it that way. Um, we're not as freaked out as people used to be about it. But I like to always land the plane with stuff like this, that it really comes down to the patients and the families that we take care of. This is where it really uh, 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 makes a difference for folks' lives and the things that they're going through and the things that they're experiencing and the help that we can provide to patients and families with genetics. So genetics itself is not super old. We really haven't known a whole lot for a long time. We didn't know how many chromosomes there were until the 1950s. So it's kind of crazy to think that we couldn't count to 46. And now like 75 years later, we are sequencing billions of nucleotides um, with, 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 with fairly uh, uh, simple uh, methods. So we've come a long way in a short amount of time. It still all lands here, though. So if and when you have seen this in the biology textbook or something like that, yes, it is true. This still this does make a difference in the way that we provide healthcare, right? Our nucleus has our chromosomes in it. The chromosomes are made up of that DNA, and that all tells the body how to make proteins. So it truly is like the central dogma, and this is how it all really goes. So when you think about genetic testing, the very maybe I can call it kind of the first, the original genetic test would be a chromosome analysis, sometimes called a karyotype, right? We're just looking at those 46 chromosomes. There should be 46. And this is what it looks like underneath the microscope. And then we can artificially line them up. Remember, they come in pairs. We get one from mom and one from dad. So that's why we're a mix of our parents for better or for worse. So we number the one through 22. Those are called our autosomes and then the X and the Y uh, for the sex chromosomes. Kind of a I don't know, an interesting tidbit, if you will. You probably notice that they go biggest to smallest, but there's actually a mistake in there. 21 is actually smaller than 22, but when the chromosomes were first numbered, you couldn't tell that 21 was smaller than 22. But the trisomy, the extra chromosome syndrome most compatible with life is trisomy 21. That is the smallest extra dose of genetic information that the body could get. So that's why it's most compatible with life. So chromosome analysis will let you look and see that, ah, someone has three 21st chromosomes. You can start to put that together with maybe some facial features or some health issues to make a diagnosis. So this is how kind of everything kind of began in genetic testing, just looking at these chromosomes, how many are there and what is missing or extra. So the next step in genetic testing was something called FISH testing. FISH is an acronym for fluorescent in situ hybridization. It is taking a fluorescent probe that matches to a particular area of the genetic code and counting this time, not necessarily even to 46, we're counting to most at three. We usually expect to see two of something because again, we have two copies of our genetic information. So if you see three or one, something's up. You could also think about using this to look for like the X and the Y chromosome. So if you see two sort of fluorescent marks, you're looking at someone who's 46XX versus if you only see one of them, likely they're 46XY. So fish testing is a fast, cheap way to count, but you have to know what you're looking for, okay? So fish testing is only as useful as what you think you might be um, looking for. 
The next step from fish testing was something called a microarray. And what a microarray is, is doing a bunch of fish tests at the same time using kind of like a, a computer chip, if you will. So each one of those little dots on there is a different area of the genetic code. And with one sort of one quick, simple test, you're looking to see if all of those areas of the genetic code are missing or extra. That goes into a computer and then spits out a report. So let me show you, show you another image to try to drum home, drive home this idea. So we have all of our genetic information. Our test goes along and it scans every chromosome. And it says, hey, on chromosome four at the P arm, remember there's two arms of your chromosomes. On the P arm, there's an area that's missing. So then we can say, well, what genes are in that area and start to understand a specific genetic condition. So this, this karyotype or microarray represents a genetic condition called Wolf-Hirschhorn syndrome, which again, is kind of a, a random rare genetic condition. But this condition is caused by a small area on chromosome four being missing. And a microarray is a way to kind of look through all the genetic code and pick out um, something. Most microarrays now slice and dice the genetic code up into like one to two million pieces. So it's the same thing as doing one to two million of those fish tests all at the same time. So hopefully, again, it makes sense that we use technology to do things faster and broader, and we're able to get quicker results back. So we think about this with, uh, with analogies a lot. And before we walk through this together, I want you to think about uh, a set of books. So for the older folks in the room or listening, I would submit to you the idea of like a set of encyclopedias. For the younger folks who have no idea what that is, how about the box set of the Harry Potter books, okay? So think about that set on the shelf. Chromosome analysis is like looking at that set of books and saying, are any of them missing or has someone put an extra book? So it's a pretty easy way to look and say, is, is it there or not, okay? Fish testing is like me saying to you, hey, go to the third book, the second chapter. Is that chapter there? Is it missing or extra? But I have to tell you exactly where to go look. Microarray is like looking through the entire set of books for any missing or extra chapters, pages, things like that. All of these are quantitative ways of looking at the genetic code, right? So we're counting. We're looking to see if things are missing or extra. It's a fairly sort of general look at things. Sequencing is looking through those books as more of like a spell check, okay? So we're not quite as interested in whether things are missing or extra. We're interested in whether they are spelled correctly or not. And just like the way we talk through like those tests with the books, you can also do the same thing with sequencing. So if you have a single gene that you are interested in, you can go and find that exact gene and look for misspellings in it. So the example of that is achondroplasia, the most common reason for someone being a little person. Essentially, every single person has a change in the same gene. And actually, almost everybody has the exact same, like A, T, C, G, like your nucleotides have the exact same nucleotide change. So if you want to test somebody for that condition, you really only have to go to one gene, really one nucleotide to do that testing. But you have to know that's what you think somebody has. So that's how you use a single gene. Gene panel tests take things that sort of are more things that cause it, okay? So think about the idea of like breast cancer, hereditary breast cancer. There are, and there are a lot of genes, but like BRCA1 and 2. So you want to look at two genes at the same time. There are actually a few other hereditary cancer genes. So a lot of times we'll do a panel of as little as two, as many as a thousand genes and sequencing them specifically target at what your patient has. They have seizures, they have developmental delay, they have heart issues. So you're focusing a little bit, but you're not necessarily looking at the entire genetic code. The last two steps of this are the exome sequencing and the genome sequencing. So instead of exactly looking at one specific place, you're essentially looking at all the genetic information. Exome sequencing, again, this is how basic biology really does come home to play a practical role. Remember your genes have exons and introns in them. Exons kind of tell the body what the, what the protein code is. So exome sequencing is just sequencing the exons, which are about 1% to 2% of the genetic code, but it's kind of the most important part of genetic code. So that was the next step in genetic testing was to sequence all those exons with exome sequencing and then to jump to genome sequencing, doing the entire thing, introns and all. Okay? So that is a very, very quick and dirty review of genetic testing, kind of how it works, how it like looks at the genetic code in different ways. And hopefully it makes sense 
that like one test doesn't do everything, but they all kind of marry together. And it depends a bit on whether you know what you're looking for, you have an idea of what you're looking for, or you really don't have any idea, or it could be anything. So you just do a big test and kind of look at everything at the same time. Okay. Feel good? Good, good. Yes, yes. Okay. All right. So now we're going to have a little bit more fun and talk about like other things that kind of come up as we do genetic testing. So this picture on the left is uh, uh, what the inside of your colon looks like. Um, nice and smooth. The, the, you know, the muscles contract and put stuff through. That uh, lumpy, bumpy one there, that is what your colon should not look like. That is a colon that is full of polyps, which are essentially precancerous and can be cancerous uh, uh, lesions. So this right picture is an example of somebody who has a genetic condition called FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis. This is a hereditary cancer syndrome where someone is born with a change in the specific gene and it causes them to have a much, much higher risk of getting colon cancer. So when we go blasting people's genetic code and looking for something, sometimes we find this sort of thing and you have no idea this is what you were looking for. So these folks, if you find that someone carries a change in this gene, they have a 100% chance of getting colon cancer at some point in their life. How would it feel if you went in and said, hey, I'd like to do genetic testing because I'm interested in learning X, Y, or Z, and you get this back, and now for the rest of your life, you know, one, you're going to get colon cancer, and there's a whole bunch of other cancers there that you also might get, so you're going to have all sorts of things screened and looked at. That is an interesting result for genetic testing that you probably weren't looking for when you went into it, but... With the power that we have now in genetic testing, this is kind of the, the, the end of the spectrum of the things that we could find. And how do we feel about that? Do we want that information? What would you do about it? Well, you could start screening earlier. You could probably know that colon cancer was developing. So these are the things that we run into when we start to do that big, broad genetic testing. Genetic testing has also changed a lot for prenatal genetic testing, testing during a pregnancy. So this is kind of a chart of the different tests that are available during a pregnancy. Some of them are blood tests. Some of them are ultrasounds. So like, you know, just putting the thing on the tummy and looking at the things that the baby has. And then that yellow line there is something genetic called cell-free fetal DNA analysis. So I'm gonna show you another picture and kind of explain how this works, but why would we be interested in other kinds of tests? So. The diagnostic tests during pregnancy are done with something called an amniocentesis or a chorionic villus sampling, CVS. And essentially, you have to go and get sample from baby, either um, by sticking a needle through the belly, taking out some of the amniotic fluid, and then taking that fluid, culturing it in the lab, growing it into cells, and then doing genetic testing on those cells. So this takes a while. It also has a risk of pregnancy loss. And so this idea of cell-free fetal DNA testing has come along in the last 10 or 15 years, and it's really changed the way that we can find things genetically. So how does this work? If we took a blood sample from every person in this room, we would find fragments of your DNA in your blood because your cells are always kind of turning over, right? So there are bits of your DNA in your blood. If you take a sample from someone who is pregnant, there are bits of the baby's DNA in that blood draw. So this is, a, again, a quantitative test. So think about lining up a bunch of buckets, and each bucket is a different chromosome. So you have a chromosome one bucket, two, three, and then a chromosome X bucket, and then a chromosome Y. You take that blood sample. You take the fragments of DNA, and each fragment, you say, ah, this is from chromosome five. It goes in the chromosome five bucket. Ah, this is from chromosome 15. and put it in that bucket. Take all those fragments of DNA and you put them in the buckets. Then you go along the buckets and you say, oh, the chromosome 21 bucket has more in it than the rest of the chromosome buckets. What could one then infer might be going on with the baby? That the baby has more chromosome 21, so Down syndrome, okay? So let's think about it this way. We look at all the buckets. The chromosome X bucket has stuff in it. The chromosome Y bucket is empty. You're going to have a boy or a girl have a girl because you just have chromosome X material. So this is how this testing works. So taking a safe blood sample from mom very early in pregnancy, we can now start to screen for chromosome differences based on fragments of the baby's DNA that are in the mom's blood. This is really cool stuff. Um, it gives you a lot of opportunity to find things way earlier and then op opportunities to uh, start to intervene um, and make a difference for patients and families. Another cool sort of prenatal thing 
the idea of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, so if a genetic condition is in a family, that condition can get passed down, right? Because we pass down our genetic information to our, to our kids. Um, if there's a genetic condition and there is a desire to not pass that genetic condition down, you can take egg and sperm, put them together in the lab, grow up a tiny embryo, test that embryo to see if it has the genetic condition, and then pick from the embryos, the ones that typically don't have the genetic condition, and use that through in vitro fertilization to help a genetic condition not get passed down. So this is the place where genetic testing a genetic technology gives us opportunities to really change the way we deliver healthcare in ways that we just straight up didn't have the ability to do previously. All right, a couple of other random things to talk about. Um, the idea of pharmacogenomics is out there right now. So if you and I have a headache and we each take, let's say, ibuprofen, our bodies do not process that drug the same, right? We may take a different dose. We may feel better at a different time sooner or later. If it gets filtered through our liver or through our uh, kidneys, it has a different impact there. We're all genetically unique in the way that medications go through our body. So the idea of pharmacogenomics is to look at your genetic code and to use that to predict what drug, what dose you should take that will give you the best benefit without some of the side effects. So again, using this company uh, that actually went out of business, which is kind of a hoot, using this company's sort of visuals here, you get to the, the well flag sooner instead of all those other things, or the classic like uh, um, you don't take bad drug A and drug B, you take drug C the first time and you feel better, okay? So how does this testing work? So this testing looks at genes. Yes, it looks at genes in your genetic code, but it's not necessarily looking for mutations in those genes. It's looking for what we call polymorphisms. So common changes in the genetic code that we all have, but then looking at the pattern of those common changes and using it to predict how our bodies metabolize medications, okay? So polymorphisms, sometimes called SNPs, are single changes in the genetic code. Again, we have millions of them. They're not all quite as important as each other. And... Um, it is really the most common part of our variation. Polymorphisms are how paternity testing works, right? So uh, um, I don't know that Maury's on the air anymore, but you remember like that you're not the father type stuff and then they all fight and things like that. So paternity testing, the idea behind paternity testing is if you take, some, you take a handful of these polymorphisms, common changes in the genetic code, and you look at kiddo, and then you look at who might be dad. If there are like 10 or 20 of these polymorphisms that are exactly the same, it becomes essentially statistically impossible for that to not be dad, just based on these common genetic changes, okay? So that's a little bit of a decide. Oh no, my button went red. I don't know what I did. We'll see if it keeps working. That's how it works as far as these polymorphisms, but the same thing goes for the way that we metabolize drugs. So the unique pattern of your genetic changes tell us whether some medications will have a higher or lower risk or higher or lower uh, efficacy in how the body works. The problem is that a lot of the indications for pharmacogenetic testing are things where we don't really have clear-cut ways of treating folks. So a lot of ADHD, a lot of pain medication, a lot of antidepressants. It is a little bit of a trial and error process. These genetic uh, variations maybe give us a little sense of how we could do better with it, but it's not perfect. But again, hopefully I, I, I can make you uh, believe that the idea behind it makes sense and that this is most certainly going to be a future part of how we deliver healthcare. It's hard to figure out how to get this information into medical records. Should this pop up like an allergy? Are doctors really gonna pay attention to these things when they're prescribing medications? So pharmacogenomics is here. It's certainly real, but it is a little hard to implement. I also wanted to briefly mention what we would call direct-to-consumer genetic testing, sometimes it's called DTC testing. 23andMe is probably the biggest one, though if you Google them, they are in not very good financial shape right now. Um, so if you have done 23andMe, you may want to look at getting your data out because they may go out of business. Um, 23andMe testing, again, uses those polymorphisms. There's a reason this test costs like 100 bucks. It's looking for common changes in the, in the genetic code. And most of the time they're giving you sort of like more entertainment type things. 
you know, do you taste this? Are you more likely to have this or that? Uh, looking at your ancestry, right? Where did your uh, 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 um, where did your folks come from? But it has started to include more and more quote unquote like medical testing. The risk with this kind of direct to consumer testing is, like I said, there's a reason that it's cheap because it's not looking at everything. So I'm not going to read this to you, but if you go into the fine uh, detail of this particular testing. You'll see that you know 23andMe testing will look at BRCA1 and 2, but it's only looking at a handful of very rare changes in that gene. So it in no way is actually doing like a true medical test on that gene. But people do this, and it's totally fine if you do it. They do it, and there's the chance of what I would maybe call false reassurance that like I did the genetic test. So again, it's not a bad thing. I don't think it's probably going to go away as far as being an option but it's not really like medical grade testing. But I think it has made us a little bit more comfortable with the idea of genetics and genetic testing. Really all of this stuff comes down to this inverted pyramid though. You're taking, um, you're taking whoop, the billions of nucleotides in your genetic code and you're trying to find the one, particularly if there's a health issue going on or something like that. What is my one explanation? What is my one answer? for the patient. And there are different ways to kind of filter through your genetic code, but ultimately like that needle in a haystack, we're trying to find that thing that gives us an answer and guides us with what to do. So I wanna talk a little bit about why hopefully like this idea makes sense using genetics in healthcare, even some of the um, uh, more uh, wild and creative things. Um, and we'll go through that. So genetic disease, there is a lot of it out there. Um, if you're not aware, the last day of February is Rare Disease Day, kind of a day to bring awareness to rare diseases. It, rare diseases are individually rare, but if you add them all up, they are more, they're one of the most common diseases out there. About one in 10 people will have a rare disease at some point in their lifetime. And the rare disease is particularly enriched for changes in the genetic code. It affects kids more often, and it has a higher morbidity and mortality rates particularly in kids. Again, it's a leading cause of death. It's a leading cause for kids to be in the hospital. You know, kids are born and usually they are fine. And when kids are sick, particularly hospital sick, the idea of something in their genetics causing that is a very, it, like it's much, much higher on the list when we're trying to figure out what we're doing. And there are plenty of studies that have looked at that, ki that kids who have genetic uh, diseases, there are much more of them in the hospital. They're much more expensive to take care of. Um, and so this gives us a way to try to figure out what's going on. So this is a, a picture that I like because I think it makes sense, particularly with how we see patients and take care of them in the hospital. So we have the little baby there in the middle and their little uh, uh, isolate uh, in the hospital. So we have a kiddo, they are sick. We try to figure out why they are sick. While we are trying to figure out why they're sick, we try a treatment, we try to do something and then we see, do they get better or do they get worse? And depending on whether they do or not, we try a different treatment. So most of the time, this is how we deliver healthcare. We kind of go around and around in that circle until we figure it out, until we don't figure it out, but we go around and around. So the idea of genetic testing, the idea of genetic diagnosis is that we bust out of that cycle and we have our sick patient. We figure out why they are sick. We then apply the correct treatment the first time fast and we don't have to go around and around and around. And I hope it would make sense to you that I would say that that is better for patients, that's better for their families, that's better for the medical team, and this actually will cost less to do it this way. And there have been studies that have been done that have compared taking care of kids and using genetic testing and taking care of kids and not using genetic testing. And when you have genetic testing involved, it dramatically reduces the cost of the medical care that these kids um, take to the, to, the, to the point of like five to six to seven digit savings. And again, this is not all about money, but again, this is what's helped drive using this testing more because it actually will help save money for patients, families, hospitals, insurance companies, et cetera. So I wanna tell you a little bit about something we tried at Helen DeVos. It was mentioned a little bit in the intro. We started using rapid whole genome sequencing about five years ago, and we got some funding from the, the, the foundation at the hospital, and we tried it on six patients. So that's a picture of the first little boy that had this rapid genome testing. And what we essentially did was we said, hey, when we have a kid who's in the hospital and they are super, super sick and we don't know why they are sick, 
we will use genome sequencing. So look at the, looking at the entire genetic code. And when we use this testing in a way that we can get a result back in as soon as like two days, okay? If you sent a genome sequence on you today to like a regular genetic testing lab, we get results back in about four months. So we are taking the time and really compressing it for the purpose of helping that really, really sick baby to get that answer fast. So again, we can bust out of that cycle. And what we found was a lot of these kids had genetic diseases. So in the first about two years that we looked at this, we had 22 kids that we tried this testing on. And you'll see 73% of them had a clear cut, like slam dunk, like, yes, this is our answer. We got, we, we got on a roll at 1.2 and got 12 in a row. Um, a couple of them were still under some further study and might be an explanation. But I'll also say that some of these kids, when we do the testing and we don't find an answer, is still extremely helpful because you've ruled out a lot of things. So this is um, just sort of a list of some of the different patients that this testing was used on. And I'm not gonna go through them all, but I'd like you to see their different ages. Um, we had different outcomes from it. Some of them, it helped avoid the surgery. Some of them, it helped predict the medication, it helped choose a medication. Um, we had one situation where the testing actually came back after the baby had passed away but we were able to tell the family why this happened and help them understand that it wasn't likely to happen again if they had more kids. So again, we have seen this be able to make an impact in a variety of clinical situations, and this is something that continues to grow and develop. So a group out in California started a project called Project Baby Bear, and I'll explain the animals to you in a little bit, and they took five different children's hospitals in California, and they said, hey, if we use this rapid testing, Will we find answers and will we change the way that we deliver medical care to those folks? And the answer to both of those was yes. You found a diagnosis in about you know, 40 to 50% of these kids and we changed the medical management in like a, a quarter to a third of them. This is awesome. And you'll also see in the far right hand, the days to result, all those are like two to three, three and a half days. That's nuts to get a diagnosis that fast for these kids. And so when you look at it and you start to run the numbers in this cohort of 100 or so patients, they did some you know, rough estimated, they probably saved about 500 hospital days for all these patients and families. Look at all the surgeries that they saved, the fewer tests that they didn't need to do. And what they found was they saved you know, a couple of million dollars by doing this testing, particularly if you did the testing early. And so again, you really saw that improved uh, uh, outcomes for patients and um, everybody really uh, did well. So what did we do in Michigan for Project Baby Deer? All right, so I told you to tell you about the animals. So this is all about state animals. So the state animal in Michigan is the deer. The animal in California is the bear. There have subsequently been, uh, there's Project Baby, Baby Manatee in Florida. There's Project Baby Armadillo in Texas. So it's all very, very cute. Um, I was talking with some folks about a national project and I said it should be Project Baby Eagle. Yeah, right? Yeah, so we'll see. So what did we do in Michigan? So we tried in Michigan a sort of a statewide approach, so not just five hospitals. And we said, hey, can we work on this rapid testing to try to get more access to using it, using it correctly to help understand why kids are sick and to try to help move things forward? And so these are all the places in Michigan that care for kids. Um, and Helen DeVos is there in a nice, a nice red, red star. So we started working on this, particularly with our friends at Bronx in about an hour south and started to work on having rapid genome testing available. We kind of went crazy and said, hey, up till age 18, that we think uh, kids don't have to just be babies. They needed to be in the ICU or not in the ICU, but really sick. And they needed to have this testing done quick. We didn't want folks to be sitting around for a couple of months before we did the, did the testing. So what was different than baby bear out in California? Um, again, we were more uh, uh, audacious with our inclusion criteria of letting older kids have this testing. It wasn't just a few hospitals. It was everywhere. California did it just with Medicaid in case uh, that's kind of a thing you know about. So in Michigan, it didn't matter. Um, we also started talking with the insurance companies in Michigan. And we also committed to gathering some of that financial stuff as we went through it. So this is our version of that other sheet. And we found pretty much the same thing. About 40% of kids we found a diagnosis in, about 25% of them we saw a change in medical management, and we saw the same thing. Bunches of hospital days saved, bunches of surgeries avoided, tests avoided, and then a reduction in the cost of the care 
to the tune of about $3,000 a patient. So this is good stuff. And this is how you start to move the needle with new things in healthcare for getting them adopted. These are some very, very cute kids who had this testing that found answers for them and for their families and their families kind of sharing their story about how it made a difference for them. So this is where it got cool. This is gonna be a little nerdy, but hopefully again, it makes sense. As we went through this work, we talked with Michigan Medicaid. So about half of kids in Michigan have Medicaid. And so we said to them, hey, would you pay for this test and believe that this will save you money if you pay for it? And they thought about it and they said, yes. And Michigan Medicaid was the first state to say, yes, we will pay for this testing and we'll pay for it as a carve out payment. So when you are in the hospital every day, your insurance company sort of pays a daily rate. So hospitals kind of get a little grumpy at having to spend money on really expensive genetic tests because they kind of can't get that money back. But if insurance companies will pay them extra for it, the hospitals are like, cool, go ahead and do the testing. And it works and insurance was willing to do it this way because again, remember we showed that if you use this testing it actually will save money. So this is really a big shift in the way that healthcare is delivered. This is really the really the only thing that's paid for sort of specially, but it's increased the access to this testing here in Michigan. And now there are about eight or nine other states that have started to do similar things. Um, and then we were able to do some work with the White House um, about a year and a half ago to talk about our experience in Michigan. It was very, very cool. So it is something that we can be very proud of, of Michiganders um, that developed and grew. So a couple things that I want to talk about, and then we'll end with hopefully a really fun story. So Working with a friend of mine, Dr. Jeremy Prokoff, um, we had a patient that had a rapid genome test come back and circled in red there is the dreaded uncertain significance. So finding a genetic change, but it is not clear whether it actually causes health problems or not. So I have a sick baby in the hospital. We used rapid genome sequencing. We found something and I don't know whether this is my answer or not. So what Jeremy does is he uses computational modeling to look at how does that specific change alter the protein structure? How is that specific change conserved through evolution in different species? And he helps us try to be able to predict whether genetic differences that we find are actually problematic or not using these tools. And Jeremy can do this in a day or two when we have to sometimes send non-genetic testing to try to confirm things. So in this particular case, we sent some um, some what we call biochemical studies and showed that yes, this gene change did cause a problem, but those took a couple of weeks to come back and his work was done in a few hours. So this is a way that we're now gonna start to use, let's say bioinformatics and some of the more uh, uh, technology driven ways of looking at our genetic code when we get these uncertain results and it's not quite clear whether it causes problems or not. So I've talked a lot about DNA and remember I talked about DNA gets turned into protein but all good science teachers would not want me to forget that in between that is the RNA, right? So the RNA is also an untapped uh, area where we're learning more and more about genetics by looking at the RNA. So if you think of DNA as kind of being the blueprint for the body to kind of tell it how it works, RNA is kind of like showing up at the construction site and seeing whether the foundation has been laid, whether the frame's up, whether the roof's on, it varies a little bit depending on what's going on. RNA is more of a snapshot of, of a moment in time rather than our genetic code. And our RNA also changes based on whether we are well or sick, whether we're having damage to various organs. So it's a little bit more fluid versus our DNA is kind of always there. So what we've done is try to understand through RNA why kids get sick. So we had an experience with a patient, a teenager, who ended up going on ECMO. So ECMO is when this machine breathes for you and makes your heart run. So you actually put giant uh, uh, catheters into your heart and into your neck and they bypass your heart and lungs. And this is what keeps kids alive. So a teenager needed this to stay alive because her body completely shut down and she was healthy prior to that. So what we were able to sort of suss out was that she had had mono. She had had EBV, like Epstein-Barr virus, and that virus seems to have triggered her genetics to kind of turn on, and that's why she got so, so sick. And the way we were able to see this was looking at her RNA. And we were able to see that her RNA looks so, so different than her RNA should have looked. 
and it helped us actually focus on a specific area of her genetic code where she had a genetic change, but it wasn't until she got sick with that virus that it kind of turned things on. And so what we, what we termed this was viral induced genetics. So basically a genetic change that was in her always, but it took um, an illness to kind of turn it on. So again, think about antiviral software on like a computer, right? It's like the, the, the virus, the, the illness comes along and turns that software off so the malware or whatever can get in there uh, and cause its damage. So just kind of a different way of looking at our genetic code, not necessarily what you were born with, but the, the environmental influences that change our genetics a bit. And turns out that we all just went through in the last few years an experience of something where a virus ran, went around, right? And some people got it and got so sick that they died. And some people got it and barely felt anything at all, right? So COVID-19 gave us another opportunity to use RNA and look at how folks responded to getting COVID. And what we found in our study is that some people's RNA showed us that when they got COVID, their immune system went into overdrive and really ramped up and they kind of really inflamed. Other people, when they got COVID, their immune system really like shut down. It like stopped working as well as it should have. So think about it. If you have somebody with COVID, and their immune system is way, way over in overdrive. You need to give them medications to calm down their immune system. If you have a patient who gets COVID and their immune system really doesn't function very well, well, we should give the medical treatment that helps boost their immune system. If you do the opposite, that will not be helpful, right? So this was a way, again, using RNA that we tried to understand the things in, uh, in our body that maybe DNA doesn't quite explain. And as we start to pair those together more and more, will help understand things more. This is another kind of interesting story of a, a family that had two children that were born at different hospitals a couple years apart. These kids both had rapid genome sequencing and found changes in a specific gene, but that gene had never been known to cause a, a, a condition before. But when they had two babies and they both had the rapid genome sequencing through our Project Baby Deer, we were able to put the pieces together and say, oh, maybe this is something there. And then we were able to work with a mouse uh, laboratory called the Jackson Lab in Maine. And they actually had a mouse on the shelf that had changes in the specific gene that matched what we saw in our patients. We were able to take two patients that kind of just happened to be born in Michigan, pull them together and describe a new genetic condition um, because we never would have known what these kids had before. So that brings me to, I think my last story it's my favorite story, so you'll have to apologize that I really enjoy this, um, and then we'll uh, have some time for thoughts or questions. So this is a little girl that came to our genetics clinic about uh, about eight years ago now. She was uh, 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 came into us with um, developmental delay. She also didn't have any hair, eyebrows, or eyelashes, which you can hopefully see in that picture. But when she had been born, she had had this kind of full head of hair that was kind of silvery gray and all of her hair fell out in chunks in the first couple of days of life. That's very unusual if you've ever, had ever hung out with a baby. Sometimes they lose a little bit of hair, but not everything. So it was very interesting to us, but didn't really have a good explanation. So eventually we found our way to exome sequencing, which was kind of, again, what was available before genome. And we found the change in this ODC1 gene. And again, if you look at the far end there, you see, what did I call it? The dreaded variant of uncertain significance. So a change in the gene, but it is unclear whether it actually causes problems or not. So it sat in my desk drawer without an explanation for several months until I realized that the answer to this patient was literally in the building next door. And it was a gentleman I had never met before. So Dr. Bachman on the left there had been doing some research with one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. Roger Sakrin, and they gave a presentation about um, some work they were doing on critical illness. And in that presentation, they were talking about these, these molecules that they were studying called polyamines. And as I was hearing their presentation, other than polyamines, kind of a funny sounding word, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, nothing really clicked. I went back and was looking at that patient's genetic test results a couple of months later. And I saw that the ODC1 gene is involved in how the polyamines work. So I was in a meeting with Dr. Roger Sacren. And I kind of said, hey, do you think this is anything? And he grabbed his phone out of his pocket and he called Dr. Bachman and we were off and running because he had been looking at this ODC1 gene for 25 years 
and he was next door and I had no idea. So for those of you who are students, this is probably something you may have seen. I used to have a paper poster of it on my wall in college. These are all the biochemical pathways in the body. In the middle there is the urea cycle, which some are familiar with. But off of the urea cycle is where the polyamine pathway comes. And the polyamine pathway turns ornithine into putrescine through this enzyme called ornithine decarboxylase. And that's where ODC comes from that our patient's gene had a change in. So this is putting that pathway just a little bit in a different orientation with ornithine at the top working through the polyamines, which are putrescine, spermidine, and spermine. This particular pathway, there was one known condition in it called Snyder-Robinson syndrome. Um, folks who have this have intellectual disability. They're kind of short, skinny. Um, they have curved spines, and they can sometimes get seizures. Um, it's actually an X-linked disorder, so it's a, a mutation on the X chromosome, so really only males have this condition. That was the only known condition in the polyamine pathway, but our patient's gene change was kind of two up in the, uh, in the stream there. So this is what the ODC protein looks like, and it has this, this kind of this hook on the end of the protein. And what happens is when the, when the protein gets made, it needs to be degraded, right? Our proteins get made, and then they get degraded. So it has this hook, and the hook's what gets grabbed to degrade it. Our patient had a mutation that caused that hook to go away, so it couldn't get gobbled up. So the protein level, the enzyme level, kept building up higher and higher and higher. And Dr. Bachman and his lab were able to show that the ODC protein or enzyme was at a higher level than it should have been. So again, some of the things that you do in lab, turns out in real life, it makes a difference for patients. And we also saw that the polyamine levels were abnormal. So again, the protein level was high, the enzyme was acting um, more than it should. It was throwing off the level of the pathway of those polyamines. So what we thought might happen was shown in the patient when we looked at their samples. And also a mouse had been made in 1996 and the mice who had changes in the ODC1 gene were missing something, they were missing their hair. So in science, a lot of times, if you find something, you then have to create an animal model to test it in. We kind of had the opposite here. We found something and there was an animal model from a bunch of years ago that kind of matched what our patient had. So we put this together and we published it as a new genetic syndrome, which was very fun. My grandmother was very proud. It was a lovely time. Um, what was really cool though, was that there were similarities in that animal model. So this is the skin biopsy from those animals that shows what we call follicular cysts. So like your hair, your hair follicles, they get little cysts there. Well, our patient kept getting these follicular cysts and they get as big as a golf ball. Um, so in the pathway, looking up there at the ODC, there's a drug called DFMO, dif difluoromethylornithine. Um, and that particular drug blocks ODC. So DFMO, efluornithine, has been around since the 70s. It was invented to treat cancer and it failed. And so drugs that fail go on the shelf. Well, it turns out that the drug was actually pretty good at ha helping treat West African sleeping sickness. So it got pulled off the shelf again and got used a lot, particularly in West Africa. And the World Health Organization actually kept this drug around because it was so useful. Otherwise, the drug company really would have no need to keep making it. And it stuck around long enough that it kind of picked back up in use in cancer and did show some promise treating colon cancer and a particular form of pediatric cancer called neuroblastoma. So this drug has been around for 50 some years. It's been treated, um, it's been given to a lot of patients. It's been given to kids which is very important, and it's been shown to be pretty safe. So, um, and sorry, the last thing was that the mice, remember that didn't have hair? When the mice were given this drug 20 some years ago, they regrew their hair. So we took samples from our patient and we treated the samples with this drug and it didn't kill the cells and the numbers all got better. So what we took was we took uh, a drug that is known to be safe in kids, an animal model that when the animals got the drug, they got better. And we took our patient samples and said that it seemed like it helped. So we were able to go to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and ask them for permission through what we call a compassionate use 
to try this drug on a patient and to see whether it would work. We got three kilos of white powder sent to us from Taiwan from the manufacturer. And we brought our patient in and treated her. So we went about 15 months from publishing the syndrome to giving her the first dose. Um, and in case it doesn't uh, uh, strike you, 15 months is really fast to discover a syndrome to go to treating it. So this is the first day she came in to get her medication. It's just a liquid. Um, hopefully you can see that, yes, she can grab my beard, but she has very, very little muscle tone. She wasn't able to sit up on her own. We gave her a 3D print of her uh, of her protein, which is what she's holding. Um, very low muscle tone and no hair. And we gave her the first dose and we kind of sat there and we were like, what happens and nothing happened. So they went home and she kept taking it twice a day. And a month later, her family sent me this picture on the left of a few eyebrows and eyelashes that had sprouted. And a week or so later, she had even more over time, we saw that she's now able to sit and her therapist is going to give her some pushes to kind of test her uh, our core strength there. This is something that she wasn't ever able to do. And you can see a lot more hair on top of her head. Um, this is a picture uh, several months later with a lot of hair now. Hopefully you also get a sense of the eye contact. Um, her family sent us this. Um, her oh, This probably would have been her second winter. Um, they'd never had to buy her clothes to go out in the snow because she couldn't play in the snow. So she's going to come down. And then again, think about the difference in muscle strength that it takes to do that, right? So significant improvement in muscle strength. And then jumping ahead a little bit of time, she's eventually going to work her way the entire way down the hall. Um, she's now able to stand, um, use a walker a bit and get around. She has sign language. Um, so changes that are so far beyond what you would expect with just normal aging and development. Because again, we found something in her genetic code. We had a medication that we kind of repurposed a bit that was targeted to her exact genetic uh, condition. And that helped uh, her improve. And this is a picture that her family sent us of them going out West. So we gathered data while we went through this. And essentially her numbers got better very, very quickly. Um, her metabolite levels, um, improved and things also didn't get worse. And then we started to hear from more patients, right? This is another little guy that we heard from. You see at birth, he's got a pretty unique hair pattern there with kind of a tuft on the top and a kind of a, a ring around there. Um, he actually didn't live in Michigan and we tried to work on sort sorting this out for him locally, uh, but his family eventually had to come and see us. Uh, we compressed the timeline a little bit more here for him being diagnosed and then starting treatment in 13 months this is the picture before we started. Again, giving a sense of uh, no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes. Um, he was a little bit more advanced where he could sit up on his own, but still very, very developmentally delayed. About a month in, hair starts to grow, eyebrows, eyelashes. Um, his family tells us that he's now uh, you know, sitting, um, th things you never would have thought of. He would actually sit and watch a TV show now. He would engage with it. He liked Mickey. Um, he was uh, much more interactive, his muscle tone, his muscle strength. Again, this is a kid who maybe like army crawled a little bit now. And if we had the audio on, you'd hear him cackling like a maniac, um, walking with a walker there. And this is the two of them hanging out, uh, our first patient um, as well. Um, and they're wearing their Bop, Bachman Bop Buddy bibs as well, which is lovely. They gave me a t-shirt, not a bib, um, which was kind. And we've continued to hear from other patients. Not a lot. We're still with only about like 10 to 15, depending on how you count it. And we've been at it for about five or six years now. But these folks are all over the world. Um, our most recent uh, contact was from China um, and talking with a family there that has a kid that was diagnosed with this. Um, and then I'm not going to jump into this story, but uh, we did have a patient that was diagnosed at two weeks old, which is always what we kind of wondered what would happen if we found somebody really, really early and we were able to get them started on treatment at 11 weeks of life. So significantly earlier than the other two patients. And as you can probably imagine, this little one has done extremely well um, because she didn't have the impairment that the others did. Um, so very, very cool. So our syndrome is now in this pathway and we now know of three or four other syndromes that exist. Um, there's probably another 15 or 20 syndromes that we'll probably eventually find in this pathway. Um, we do wonder a lot about treatment. Could we use the DFMO drug for some of these other syndromes? We don't know, which is part of the work that we're working on now.
So ultimately, this is the picture that kind of sticks in my head when I talk about this stuff. It feels like a little bit of a tidal wave. Um, I feel personally like it's a bit overwhelming just trying to understand what to make of this and to not get crushed, but it is a very, very exciting time. And then if I can use this analogy to close us, um, I don't want people to ever think that like we figured it out, we're on the yellow brick road, we know where we're going. This is probably more the reality <laughs> that we generally know where we're going, we know where the road is. This is probably even more realistic that there are lots of different folks that are kind of working at this. We're all generally headed in the right direction. But I think ultimately the biggest uh, call to action is to not like sleep in the flowers, but to keep walking and keep pursuing the things that are ahead of us um, because it is a very exciting time. And I am very, very thankful to be able to get to hang out with you to go through this stuff. And thank you so much for your attention. I'll remind you, Rare Disease Day is coming up in a couple of weeks. And we do have an event here in Grand Rapids that is free um, that will have a lot of really cool stuff um, for the students in the room. There's lots of kind of pre-health things there as well to kind of hear about careers in rare disease. Um, so I know I'm a little biased, but it's a super good time. So uh, thank you all for your time. Thoughts, questions? Yes, ma'am. Your um, patients—did um, they all have the same mutation, or were they similar mutations, the same region of the of the protein, or were they different? Yeah. So I'll just repeat it for folks who are online. Where the question was around the the Bachman butt patients and where their gene changes are. So yes, all the changes for the patients that seem to have the syndrome are kind of in that one area. Again, I I just using analogies, kind of this hook area. Um, they are not all the same changes. Uh, they do seem to be more like nonsense mutations, splice site mutations. So it like really does like mess up the protein to use a technical term. Um, we've seen uh, one specific genetic change in a couple of patients, so the same one, but it's not like the same things coming up over and over again. Look, one of the questions that we have that we don't have the answer to is what about the rest of the protein that's not in that area? people have to have changes here. Is it the same thing? We've had a couple of folks that we've heard from that don't seem to look the same that have changes there, but that's something that we're working on a little bit more to try to understand. So I don't really know what the full spectrum of this disorder actually is. Other questions? Anything from online? Yep, I got it. How far? off are we from specific mutation function function in SCN8A? Uh, the gene, how the mutation works, gain or loss function is rare. Okay. So when you have a change in the gene, sometimes those changes can be what we call loss of function, which hopefully makes sense. Other times it's a gain of function. Gain of function is less common than loss of function. Because again, like it's easier to break something rather than make it work like over time. So with our Bachman Bupp work, that actually is more of a gain of function, which makes it a little bit more uh, uh, easy. Nothing's easy. It makes it a little bit easier to treat because something's going on too much and you just have to stop it versus if something's broken, you have to replace it. So, um, RNA gives us a way to try to understand gain of function or loss of function because you have a change in the gene, but you don't exactly know what it does. But when you look at the next step, looking at the RNA, if the RNA is kind of all wacky and uh, doing different things, it can give you a little sense into gain of function or loss of function. But it is one of the problems and one of the questions that we have with different, different genetic syndromes is trying to take the gene change and understand what exactly does it do and then what do we do about it. And that's where animal models sometimes come in as an option for us. Because if you can take a specific gene in an animal, you can look at how does that animal act and you can try different treatments uh, and see what it does. But it is very expensive and it's very slow to do that kind of work. Um, there is some uh, experimentation going on now with, with stem cells, with the idea of like pluripotent stem cells or looking at what we call iPSCs, so induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is not like baby stem cell type stuff. This is taking cells in the lab, putting genetic changes in them, and then making those cells turn into a kidney cell or a heart cell or a brain cell, and using that as, a, as, as kind of a model system for testing how genetic changes uh, impact 
the way that the kidney functions. And again, trying treatments in a little bit more of a, a, a controlled setting that is faster and cheaper, but it's still not easy to do. But these are some of the techniques that we have. That also gets into the idea of people will sometimes ask uh, about like CRISPR, right? So CRISPR is a way of doing gene editing in the more in a more controlled setting. CRISPR is particularly attractive because to set up a CRISPR system is actually pretty cheap. So it's easy to do and doesn't require like a million dollar grant. You can start to work on that in a, in a smaller setting. So it is a little bit like, uh, like crowdfunding something where you kind of put out uh, uh, and let a lot of people work on it at the same time. And that kind of helps drive innovation. So that's maybe not specific to SCN 8A, but at least uh, 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 speaks to some of the broad strokes of what we have right now, what's kind of being worked on. Uh, where can patients go for genetic testing, like Alzheimer's, if you don't want to use 23andMe, et cetera? So yes. So 23andMe does give you the option for testing for conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I will say that for something like Alzheimer's disease, genetics is more about risk, okay? So um, my grandfather on my mom's side was one of eight kids and seven of them got Alzheimer's. So like inherently genetically, I am massively predisposed to that just because of like my family. So I need to like do my Sudoku as much as possible to keep my brain ticking, right? But everybody's kind of risk is different, right? And so it does depend a little bit where you were born. If this is a cliff that you're gonna fall off, were you born right at the edge of the cliff? So you're gonna like have something happen easily or uh, this is a little data, but for the older folks, are you like a Keith Richards, the guy, the guitarist from the Rolling Stones that you're born here? So you can do everything possible to hurt your body, but you still like never have something actually happen. So we can look at our familial risk for things like, is there, does asthma run in your family? Does mental, uh, their mental health issues run in your family and kind of have a sense. But then we can also look at your genetics and help understand that risk a little bit more. So things like Alzheimer's, we can look at uh, a particular gene called APOE and people have different changes in that gene that kind of increase or decrease their risk. But we still don't exactly know if, you, if you're kind of born at the edge and you have a much higher risk, well, you can't get much closer to the edge versus if you're born far away from it, um, maybe that risk gets you a little bit different. Um, as far as where that testing can get done, um, we do, um, I work in our medical genetics clinic. Um, so Corwell has, I think the only genetics clinic uh, in the west side of the state. Um, there are genetic uh, clinics in other places as well. Um, you can go to the American College of Medical Genetics. They have like a find a geneticist or find a genetic counselor um, function as well. Um, and so that's a way to find out where uh, you can learn a little bit more about that. <clears throat> yep. All right. We'll do one more uh, talking about RNA. When you look at the RNA, a little bit more detail, how that works. Um, all right. Um, so... RNA sequencing, um, yes, it can be a little dependent on where you get the RNA from, right? Because we talked about uh, uh, the, the levels being different. Practically, for a patient, it is usually easiest to get blood from somebody, right? So most of the RNA sequencing that gets done gets done on blood. Um, in a perfect world, that like if you have a brain problem, we could get a brain sample, but like that's not really how things work. Um, so we do most through blood. Um, we're trying to experiment a little bit now with uh, using cheek swabs because like the cells of your cheek will have the RNA. It'll give you a little sense of it as well. Um, and then some folks will talk about using urine or like the sediment from the urine because not just liquid comes out. There's like stuff in there and it'll eventually settle. Urine's disgusting. So again, uh, but there's stuff in there that you can get. Like there are like cells and things that there's another access point for you to do that. So a lot of RNA stuff, uh, the work that we've done, comes down to uh, Jeremy Prokop's work do, looking at the data analysis and trying to pull out things from like the, the, the global RNA profile that give us specifics that we can understand a little bit better. So um, thank you so much for the time. Thank you for the folks online for the questions, for those in the room. Um, have a wonderful night and it was great to hang out together.